Well, we're going to continue our exploration of Beyond Coincidence, part two. In the first session that we did last time, we explored the evidence of design in the creation. Went through the anthropic principle and a lot of other things that, to demonstrate that as we look at the creation, we're, uh, uh, we're without excuse. It's interesting that the creation itself, God declares, is, uh, uh, leaves us without excuse to know who he is. That may surprise you. That's the creation. His redemption you can only learn from the Word of God. It's a little different. So we're taking beyond coincidence in two areas. Last time we took the evidence of design in the creation. It, couldn't, it goes far beyond having occurred by randomness. That's a myth, a lot, in fact, a bald-faced lie that we teach our kids in school and our entire culture is based on. Nevertheless, tonight we're going to go to part two, the evidence of design in the Word of God. I get so tired of uh, TV commentators and others who mean well, even Christians, Christian with that mean well, they go to say something, they preface it with a little statement like, well, you can't prove the Bible, but, and they make their point. That's wrong, you can. You can. Uh, uh, you just uh, you have to know how to go about it. So we, the two discoveries that are the, piv the, the, the foundation of our ministry is that these 66 books we call the Bible, even though they were accumulated over almost 2,000 years by over 40 different writers who didn't even know each other. Having said that, what makes it astonishing is that we have in our possession an integrated message system. My technical background, I've spent 30 years in the strategic arena, but my technical background is in the information sciences from way back. And so I'm using these terms very precisely. We have in our possession an integrated message system. And uh, it consists of 66 separate books penned by over 40 different individuals and over thousands of years. And the discovery is that every detail is there deliberately. It's anticipated by deliberate, skillful design. And uh, you need to discover that for yourself to have it have any impact. But as you do, it's staggering to realize that this package of 66 books is designed as a package. And I don't mean just thematically, that there's a theme in the Old Testament fulfilled in the New. No, no, much more than that. That every number, every place name, every subtlety, even the letters themselves and, and, and their arrangement is designed. And as you discover that, it has staggering implications because the next thing you discover is the origin of that design had to come from outside the dimensionality of time. And that's one reason we spent some time in our uh, a little briefing package on time and space, because that's relevant to this. Now, so we have an integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. It's one book. I often thought we should promote this talk by announcing publicly that tonight we're Come on to the talk tonight. Tonight we're going to tear out the page in the Bible that's unnecessary. That'll smoke out all the fundamentalists, right? And then with great ceremony, we'll tear out the page between the Old and New Testament. It's one book. It's one thing, okay? So anyway, I want to give you an example of that, a very simple one. And that's the strange incident in Numbers 21. The occasion was that there were uh, some snakes that God sent that was biting people that killed them because they were... Uh, due for judgment. And uh, as the snakes started to kill people, they asked to be taken care of. Uh, Moses goes to God and prays, and God says, okay, what you do is you take a, make a brass serpent, put it on a pole on top of the hill, and everybody that looks to it will be cured. Okay. He does what he does, and they were. But there's no explanation why. God can obviously cure them any way he wanted to. He selected this rather weird way of doing things. A brass serpent on a pole. A serpent is a symbol of sin, right? Brass is on a pole. I mean, what's that, what's that all about? Now here's the You can read the entire Old Testament, or the Tanakh in Jewish terms, the whole, what we call the Old Testament, and you will find no discussion, no explanation, what was that all about? They were obviously grateful that they were saved. Did they understand? What, what, what was the lesson? What was the point? What's this all about? 
In fact, a thousand years later under Hezekiah, that brass serpent is still around and they're worshiping it. And he gets upset about that, so he takes it and destroys it, calls it Nehushtan, a, a thing of brass. And uh, because he, they were worshiping it like you might worship the Shroud of Turin or something. It was inappropriate. But you still have no explanation of what's going on there. It isn't until you get to the New Testament and get to the Gospel of John, chapter 3, where Nicodemus comes to Jesus that night. And, uh, well, first of all, the verse in chapter Numbers 21. The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Wow. Kind of weird. Why? Well, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, all these things happened unto them for examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now, the, the word here for examples in the Greek is tupos or typos. What is a type? It's a figure, an image, a pattern, something prefiguring, sort of symbolic anticipation, if you will. That's the, we use the term prototype. It comes with a very similar kind of concept. Okay, that's a pattern, in other words. Everything in the Old Testament, all these weird rules, all these strange things, every one of them, is there deliberately. And part of your discovery in studying the Bible is to uncover why is it that way there. And uh, I'll tell you a secret. Every time, the, this is what a rabbi would call a remez, a hint of something deeper. Anytime you see something in a story that seems extraneous or extra, unnecessary, oh, that's called a remez, a hint of something deeper. It's a sign that says, dig here, there's a treasure hidden. Okay, well, we get to Nicodemus in uh, ch John chapter 3, and uh, he, Jesus explains to Nicodemus, he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that what, who, wh whosoever believeth in him should not perish and have everlasting life. In other words, wow, the serpent on the pole is an, a deliberate anticipation of Jesus on the cross. You see, designing it back there in Numbers 21, God had the benefit of knowing what was going to happen in Matthew 27. You follow what I'm saying? See, we take those things for granted, but we stop and think about it. Thousands of years advance, God plants this little, what shall I call it, like a plot device, because it's going to echo through history to, 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 to explain the cross. And by the way, this event is not only explained by Jesus Christ to Nicodemus here, it leads to the most famous verse in the entire Bible. Jesus continues, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16, of course, is probably the most well-known verse of all, and it emerges from Jesus explaining this to Nicodemus. The point I'm trying to make here, though, search the Old Testament. You won't find a glimmer of insight as to what this was all about. Jesus explains it to us. So that's, but a little clue I'll give you is whenever you find a remez, it'll always in some way impinge on your understanding of the Messiah. Okay, remezim always points to my, a little point that you took away. Well, that leads to another question that I'd like to explore. Are there hidden messages in the Bible? Now, the truths of the Bible are manifest. You can't miss them. So don't misunderstand me. At the same time, God is infinite. And uh, he tells us in, in uh, Proverbs 25, 2, he says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. And it's the duty of kings, or the honor of kings, to search out a matter. So yes, there are puzzles put there deliberately. And some of them are very clever. Some of them are very complicated. Let's take a very simple one. I'm going to start with a riddle. Who is the oldest man in the Bible? Anyone? Methuselah. Good for you. Yes, he, he lived 969 years. Yet he died before his father. Ah, yeah. How can he be the oldest man in the Bible, yet he died before his father? And that, that's a puzzler until you remember who his father was. His father was Enoch, who didn't die. Okay? 
And uh, he was, if you excuse the expression, raptured or translated. And uh, so, so. Now, this guy Enoch's an interesting character. At age of si 65, that began a 300-year walk with God. He walked with God, whatever that means, for 300 years. Something happened when he was 65. And the, what, it was a, an occasion with the birth of his son. And God apparently told him that as long as his son is alive, the judgment of the flood would be with him. Now, the first thing you've got to understand, the flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. It was preached on for four generations. But Enoch was told that as long as his son is alive, that the judgment would be withheld. Can you imagine, girls, can you imagine raising that kid? Every time he caught a cold, the neighborhood would go into panic, right? Well, sure enough, uh, the, uh, well, that, and because of that, Enoch names his son Methuselah. It comes from two uh, Hebrew roots. Muth, which is a root that means his death, and shalak is a verb which means to bring or send forth. The word Methuselah is a combination of those roots, which means his death shall bring. And indeed, as long as that kid is alive, the judgment is withheld. But when he dies, that will bring the flood. It turns out, if you study Genesis 5 carefully, Methuselah was 187 when he has a son by the name of Lamech. And uh, Lamech was 182 when Noah was born. And Noah, it was in his 600th year that the flood came. In other words, the year that Methuselah dies is the year the flood came. He was a prophecy. It's interesting that his lifetime then becomes a, a type or an idiom of God's, grace, God's mercy. So it's very appropriate that his lifetime is the longest lifetime in the, in the Bible. That's not an accident. I think it's designed. But let's get on with this a little bit. In, when you read uh, the book of Genesis, chapters one, chapter 1 and 2, it's the creation and Adam and all that. Genesis 3 is the seed plot for the whole Bible. Everything in the Bible has its roots there in Genesis 3. Genesis 4 is the first murder, Cain and Abel, all of that. From Genesis 6 on, you got the flood and a lot of action, but Genesis 5 is one of those chapters you're tempted to sort of skim over. It's just a genealogy. What can there be in that, right? Well, the trouble with Genesis 5 is it is a genealogy of 10 people. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Hmm. The problem is it's not translated for you. The words are transliterated. What that means is you have an approximation here of how they're pronounced in Hebrew. They're not translated. It's, a, you know, uh, we don't generally apply meaning to names. My, name, my legal name is Charles. What does that mean? Who knows? All kinds of speculations. None of them really that authoritative. Uh, but uh, in Hebrew, every word is made up from Hebrew roots, and if you know the meaning of the letters that make up the root, you can read Hebrew, by the way, pretty much, about 80 percent, according to the Hebrew department in Arizona that told me that. Anyway, the point is, is that, um, let's get this translated and see what it says. Well, the first word is Adam. That one's not hard to guess. It it's auto, comes from Adama, which means man. No surprise. Adam, man, we can relate to that. He has a son by the name of Seth. Now here's the situation, the, the root Seth really uh, uh, suggests being appointed. In fact, Eve explains that to us in the previous chapter. She said, Eve said, for God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. You all know the story, Cain murdered Abel, right? Everybody asks, where did Cain get his wife? He married his brother's wife because, he, he married his brother's sister because he was Abel. Helps not all it's cracked up to be. I understand. Okay. But anyway, that gives us a clue. The word Seth is a root implying appointed. Okay. Now he has a son, when he grows up, he has a son by the name of Enosh. And that's a Hebrew word that means mortal or frail or miserable. Kind of tough handle to go through school with. You're going to pick up, you know, uh, choose up basketball teams. Hey, miserable, you're on our team. <laughs> Doesn't really work, does it? It comes from the root anash, which it means incurable, like a wound or of grief or woe, sickness, wickedness, what have you. 
Okay, so Enosh has a son, and he names him, I don't know if this is out of spite or what, but he names his son Kenan. And that means sorrow, dirge, or elegy. Um, that also doesn't kind of work for a handle for a guy, does it? You know. So after a couple of generations of that, I think Kenan, when he had a son, he says, enough of this. He named his son Mahalalel. Now that's a mouthful, but it's a great name. It comes from two roots. It, mahal, mahalal, mahal, which means blessed or praised one, and the name El for God. It means, Mahalalel means the blessed God, the praised God. Kind of hard to pronounce, but pretty great handle in it, right? In fact, it's interesting through the Bible to notice how often the word El appears in Jewish names because it honors them, Daniel, God's my judge, and so forth. Okay, the blessed God. Well, he has a son by the name of Yared, and that is a verb, a Yarad in the Hebrew, which means shall come down. Shall come down. Okay, there's a story behind it, but I'll spare you that tonight. That leads us to Enoch. We mentioned Enoch, but it turns out his name is basically an academic term implying commencement or teaching. Okay? So he has a son by the name of Methuselah, which we've already mentioned. It's from Muth and Shalak. Uh, his death shall bring. And uh, as, you, as we pointed out earlier, the year that the flood comes is the year that, uh, the year that Methuselah dies is the year the flood comes. Okay, he has a son by the name of Lamech. Now here's a case where the root is still in our language in English. The root is evident in our English word lament or lamentation. The root means despairing, despairing, okay? Now, Lamech has a son by the name of Noah. How many of you have heard of Noah? It's about 40%. That's a little discouraging. <laughs> Let me try it again. How many of you have heard of Noah? All right, that's all right. Sorry to keep you awake there. I just thought, all right. Uh, yeah, we've all heard of Noah. I'm just being facetious. Noah is, is a two-letter root that comes from Nacham, which means to bring relief or comfort. In fact, his uh, 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 comfort or rest. Uh, in fact, his father, Lamech, says so in Genesis 5.29. He said he called his name Noah, saying, this same shall comfort us concerning our work in the toil of our hands. Okay. Okay. So we have the genealogy. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. I'm, I'm sure my Jewish friends are upset because I'm, I'm doing a terrible job pronouncing them properly, but bear with me. Let's not read it. It's pronounced in Hebrew. Let's translate it. What is it saying? Man, pointed, mortal, sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death, whose death? God's death. The blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Wow, huh? Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Now this has a number of implications. It points out that God's program for redemption was not some knee-jerk reaction to Genesis 3. It was planned before the foundation of the world. But it also is something else. There's no way you will ever convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide this summary of the Christian gospel in a genealogy of the sacred Torah itself. You've got to be kidding. It's evidence of design. And they say, well, gee, Chuck, that's pretty, I don't know. Okay, well, I, I, I find it impressive. You draw your own conclusions. I report, you decide, right? Okay. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And here's a summary of the Christian gospel tucked away in the first genealogy. Anyway. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Well, what about Bible codes? We always get that question. When people say Bible codes, what they really mean is a specific code that's gotten a lot of propaganda and promotion, what have you. As a specialist in crypto, first of all, most people writing in this area have no background in cryptology. But as a, as a specialist in cryptology, um, I can tell you that there are many different kinds of encryptions in the Bible that are studied. If you're a study of uh, cryptology, you'll discover the uh, Atbash and Albam and these various types of transformations that are in the Bible deliberately. But set that all aside. They're the more interesting ones. But there's one particular kind of code 
called an equidistant letter sequence. Well, what on earth is an equidistant letter sequence? I'll show you here. There's a lot of fanciful and contrived stuff that's been popularized in some books that's nonsense. It's too bizarre to be accepted on the one hand and yet too impressive to be totally ignored. The problem is that professional competence in cryptology is essential to adequately evaluate them. So we're not going to go down some of those paths because that's a whole complicated area. Let's take some simple example. What is an ELS, an equidistant letter sequence? It's a sequence of letters that are equidistant within some message. And I'll give you a simple example of one. One of the experts in this field is a Dr. Rips. Anyway, the sentence that's contrived here is, Rips explained that each code is a case of adding every fourth letter to form a word. That's the sentence. That's the message. What message is hidden inside? Well, take a look at every fourth letter. There's an R, then an E, A, and then a D. And, and when you take those every fourth letter, it says, read the code. Now, this is just a little example to give you the idea that you can embed a message inside another message by indulging in what's called an equidistant letter sequence. It is a terrible, uh, inadequate way of hiding a message because they're easily broken, frankly. But it is a way to communicate something hidden. And it's the simplest one. There are more complicated ones. I'll, sit, I'll spare you those tonight. We'll just take a look at this here. Let's take an example of one of these. This is the beginning of the book of Genesis. Now, Hebrew, all, all uh, languages flow towards Jerusalem. All nations east of Jerusalem go from right to left. That Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, Sanskrit, you name it, even Chinese. All nations that are west of Jerusalem go from left to right. Not only English, Latin, uh, Cyrillic, Greek, you name it. So I uh, just thought I'd mention that to you. I'm not sure what you'll do with that piece of information. But the main point is, is that Hebrew goes, from our point of view, backwards, okay? Well, there are four letters in Hebrew that spell the word Torah. Torah are the five books of Moses. The most venerated part of the Old Testament is the Torah. And it, it's spelled in Hebrew with four letters, a Tau, a Vav, a Resh, and a He. And they, they approximate a T-O-R-H in our language. Okay. Well, you go in Genesis to the first Tau, and that's the, what we would consider a T. Then you count 49 letters, 7 squared, count 49 letters, you come to a Vav, which is sort of like an O. And then you count 49 letters, and you come to a Resh. And then you count 49 letters again, and you come to a He. And that happens to spell Torah in Hebrew. So if we look at that, well, so what? I mean, it's kind of weird, right? And uh, that could have just happened accidentally by the statistics of letters, maybe. Well, you go to the next book, book of Exodus, and you discover the same thing happens again. The first how, count 49 letters, you get a vav. Found 49 letters again, you get a resh. Count 49 letters again, you get a hey. And once again, you get Torah. Now you're getting a little uncomfortable. Whatever the probabilities of it happening by accident before, they just got squared. <laughs> okay? If, there, if, if that was one in a million chance, this is a one in a trillion chance or whatever. So you go to the next book, Leviticus, and it doesn't happen. You feel a sigh of relief, probably. You get to the book of Numbers, and something even stranger occurs. The same thing happens spelled backwards. And the first thought that runs through your mind is, who had time on their hands to even find this out? You know, <laughs> With a computer, it's easy, but doing it manually is another... That, that's a chore. You go to the last book, Deuteronomy, and you discover the same thing happens again. It's spelled backwards. Now you stand back from this, 49, 7 squared, you have these letter sequences. Genesis, Exodus, Torah is spelled forward. Numbers and Deuteronomy, it's spelled backwards. That's kind of weird. Did that happen by accident? Let's take another look at Leviticus, and we won't take 49, we'll take the square root of that. 
49 is 7 squared. Let's just take 7 itself. And we, we know there's a yod, a yod, ha, yod, he, vav, he. The unpronounceable name of God. Wow, Yahweh, if you will. There are other con con uh, conclusions. But anyway, uh, so we have Genesis, Exodus, going from left to right. Numbers, Deuteronomy, going backwards. And Yahweh in between. And we discover that the Torah always points to yod heh -Vav -Heh, or Yehovah. Now, the question before us then, aside from what's, what point is this? It's a design. Um, is it by random accident? No, I think this is beyond coincidence. This is evidence of design. But it has huge implications because you take one letter out and it falls apart. Not only did Moses receive the five books of Moses from God, I believe he got it letter by letter. One letter missing or one letter too many and it doesn't happen. In computer, maybe it's like a checksum. Huh? Okay. Let me show you something else. The book of Genesis is quite a book, of course. But perhaps the climactic story from a, a story point of view is the story of Joseph. You get to chapter 37. That starts from there to the end of the book. The this incredible career of this guy that was sold by his brothers into slavery gets trapped, in, trapped with the, the boss's wife to where he gets put in prison. Uh, he was innocent, but the point is he's in prison. And uh, for 13 years, patiently in prison, and he ends up interpreting a dream which plunges him into the career of being the prime minister of the known world. You've got to be, you know, you, and, and the story of his uniting with his brother, I mean, the whole thing has got to be one of the most gripping uh, dramas in the Bible. Terrific. From 37 to 50 in, in Genesis. But in chapter 38, you have inserted what really is, appears to be an unrelated story that's got to be one of the most sordid stories in the Scripture of how Judah gets tricked into sleeping with his daughter-in-law. I mean, weird stuff. It's hard to read that, uh, ch chapter 38, if you've got a young family that you're trying to explain things to. And many people wonder, what's that doing in the Bible anyway? Why is it there? It's very important that it's there because uh, she is, Emma is, is, is uh, on the, in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So it's a critical chapter, it turns out. But it has some surprises that you won't see by just reading the story. In fact, you can know Hebrew and still miss this unless you know what to look for. Turns out that at 49 letter intervals, you have the name Boaz. Oh, that's interesting. And you, you, then you have another, following that, you have another name, 49 letter intervals, by the name of Ruth. Gee, what a coincidence if you know the story, huh? You continue, you, you find another uh, uh, three letters that are the, is the name Obed. And you keep going on this, you find another uh, root called Yishe, which we would call Jesse. And you climax with a trio of letters, 49 letter intervals, that's David. Now let me put this together for you. You've got Roaz, Ruth, Obed, Jesse, and David. Those are in the family tree of David, the most venerated king in the Bible, next to Christ, of course. They're all in 49-letter intervals, and they're all in chronological order. How many of you think that was by accident or just the statistics of language somehow? It's even stranger than that. We're talking about the book of Genesis, after which comes Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, then Joshua, then Judges, 
Finally, you get to Samuel. And you get to the life of David. And you all know the story how the nation wanted a king and God, you, they, they, he allows them to get a King Saul, right? So was David an afterthought? No. Saul was just premature. They insisted they got him. David was in the wings, whether he knew it or not. From the 38th chapter of Genesis on, it's encrypted there. You see what I mean by it's not only is it in design, the designer had to be somebody outside the dimensionality of time altogether. Now, if you don't understand that, you've got to get our breathing pack beyond time and space to get a flavor that time is a physical property. And God is not subject to the restrictions of time. He's outside time altogether. And he demonstrates that uniqueness by this kind of thing. And it's all through the scripture. I'm just giving you a few samples here. ELSs. We looked at a few in the Torah. I've shown you one on the genealogy of David. In Genesis 1, verse 14, we talk about the creation. It says he created the sun and the moon for seasons. The word there is actually hamoyedin, the appointed times. If you take that word and have a computer search for it, the entire uh, 43,000 letters in Genesis, you'll discover it appears only once, centered on that verse it, with intervals of 70. And to a Jew, that's a shock because he knows that there are exactly 70 appointed times. Take the 52 Saturdays, you add the seven Shabbatim, you add the, if you go through the list of the things that there's committed to honor, there are 70 of them. There are 70, Hamoyedin, 70 appointed times. So why are the letters arranged so that, ex- that in exactly that ELS is it's centered on this? Is that a statistical accent? Of course not but it's a fingerprint of the designer. Trees. The last few verses of chapter 1 and the first few verses of chapter 2 talk about every seed-bearing tree. Just a few verses there. And you discover that there are 25 different trees mentioned in the Bible. They're all encrypted there within those few verses. All the seed-bearing trees are encrypted. The different names of them, biblically, are there. That's interesting. In Isaiah 53, we have this incredible Old Testament discussion of Jesus uh, uh, on the cross, the the crucifixion. In those 12 verses, you have encrypted in those verses the names of the 12 disciples. You have um, three Marys. You've got two Jameses and so forth. Uh, Caiaphas uh, and uh, Annas and so forth. The people that were at the place of cross are encrypted in those 12 verses. It gets worse than that. There is a a name that is composed of very high frequency letters that statistically should appear appearing encrypted in in that space that is conspicuous to an analyst that it's not there. That's the name of Judas. Statistically it should show up by randomness and it doesn't. Its, Its absence is almost more convincing than the other names being present. There are two Jameses, not three, because the third one didn't become a believer until after the the, uh, resurrection. There are three Marys. Uh, One of them is encrypted, connected with John, by the way. And it goes on and on. Okay. Well, what about our DNA? You know, we talk about codes and stuff. You can't talk about codes today without talking about the genome and the great thing that we now know about the DNA and all that stuff. And the DNA is a list of codes, and I won't, uh, you know, go further into that here in this discussion, except to point out that in the DNA... You make your the most rap the most frequently consulted library in the world is in each of your cells because it's constantly going to the main room, getting a copy of what it needs, and makes a copy of what it needs, and then edits it for its purposes. The DNA is copied to become the RNA, and then machinery pro, pro, uh, protein molecules that make our machines edit this. They take out what they call introns, and they're removed and the exons are spliced to be what they need. Do you remember what this is? That's an equidistant letter sequence. That's an equidistant letter sequence. And uh, if you pick up a book on microbiology, they'll tell you that, uh, that the introns are just junk DNA. They didn't know what it was for, so they assumed it was 
from some early false start or something, and they call it junk. They call that junk DNA. That's the early text. They now have discovered that. The, the, by the way, the so-called junk DNA. Do you know what percent of the DNA that is? Over ninety-five percent. Ninety-five percent is junk. Gets serious. No, they're now discovering it's architectural. It has other purposes. They don't direct, it's not used to make direct make proteins. It is used for other purposes. The codes. It's a three out of four error correcting code, something that probably not one engineer in a hundred would know how to design. And uh, it's error correcting, self replicating, and on. And it also, all the machinery, the code develops its own machinery to decode itself, and it can also do something our computers can't. It, re it, re it replaces itself, it makes more copies of itself. Now, that's a whole other story. Let's get it back here. Jesus told us a little bit about understanding the Word of God that many people overlook. In Matthew 17, 18, chapter 5, he says, Think not, Jesus speaking, think not that I come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, a yacht or a tittle is a, a Hebrew, a Hebraism, um, that is, well, a, a yacht is a little, looks like an apostrophe. You and I would mistake it for an apostrophe. It's almost like a little blemish on the paper, a yacht. It's one of 22 letters that's a letter. A tittle is the little decorative hook on some of the letters. This is a Hebrew way of saying, not the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T will pass until the law is uh, uh, This is a call by the author himself to take his text seriously. That's one reason you don't want to rely on a paraphrase. I'm not knocking these modern paraphrases. They're a wonderful way to use devotionally, not for serious study. Because you're missing... <laughs> Remember Walter Martin used to lean over the, the pulpit and say, you would paraphrase God? <laughs> <laughs> No, if you're really serious about your Bible, you want to find out what the root text really says. In today's world, you can go directly to the Hebrew or Greek without knowing Hebrew or Greek, because there's software that'll do it for you. You put your little cursor over any word, and up pops a little box, which tells you what it said in the original, what part of speech it is. It'll even diagram the sentence for you if you want it to. And so you don't have to know Hebrew and Greek to get at the original. Now, some of that is subtle. You still may have to know some grammar and stuff. But the point is that to do that is free. The software for your computer that will do all that is free. You can do it on the Internet for free. If you haven't discovered the Blue Letter Bible, you're in for an a incredible treat. Now, there's something else in the interest of covering some other things. I'm, I'm just going to summarize for you. They've also discovered that the text has a sevenfold structure in it. The book of Esther, there's all kinds of discoveries in terms of the way it's designed below the text. The genealogy of the first chapter of Matthew has rules of seven that I defy you to match creating a family tree out of fiction. Do a family tree out of fiction in which uh, 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 every that every, everything you look at it, you divide, if you divide it by seven, it comes out without a remainder. That every, the number of verbs, the number of consonants, the, uh, the, the forms, there, there are literally dozens of rules of seven. It meets all of those. And I would defy you to fabricate one yourself from imagination. They're that complicated. They fit that tightly. The last 12 verses of Mark, some of your Bible's a little footnote, well, those, la those last verses must have been added later. Whoever wrote that uh, obviously was un uninformed because the last 12 verses of Mark are so designed, you couldn't simulate them if you had a million supercomputers working for over a million years. And there's analysis for that. It gets complicated, so I didn't want to include it in this particular briefing. I invite you to, to take a look at that. We do have our materials on that. But I'll give you just one example that I think is kind of colorful. Um, you can take, say, for example, the Gospel of Matthew, and you'll discover that there are a, a, a list of words that only Matthew uses. The other writers of the Gospels didn't use them. The list happens to be 42, divisible by seven exactly. Now, the question I have to ask is, okay, 
Suppose Matthew decided to do that on purpose. He wanted to make the, the words that he only uses a multiple of seven exactly. How would you go about that? You've got to do one of two things. You either give that list of 42 words to everybody else writing books in the Bible and say, don't use these words, please. Okay. How many think that happened? I don't think so. The other thing is, then the only other way it could happen is for Matthew to have written his gospel last. To, fix, to, to, to arrange it so that the number of words that nobody else used is exactly a multiple of seven. Let's assume he wanted to do that. That's the only other way he could do it, isn't it? So I could use that argument that the words that are unique to Matthew are a multiple of seven to prove that Matthew wrote his gospel last, right? If I go to Mark, the same thing's true. Mark wrote his last because he has a list, a multiple of seven exactly, of words that nobody else used. That means Mark wrote his last. No, John's. The, wor the words unique to the Gospel of John are a multiple of seven exactly, so John wrote his last. No, no, it turns out <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James, Jude, Peter, their writings all have a list of, uh, a multiple of seven exactly of words that nobody else used. Now there's no way you could contrive that. It would be hard enough if they were all in the room together doing this as a competition somehow. Interesting. Each one was written last. That's kind of fun. Well, let me give you one other thing. Uh, I want to measure our confidence. How many believe that the Bible is the Word of God? Can I see a show of hands? That's the vast majority of you. That's good. Okay, great. Um, how sure are you? How sure are you? Uh, the prophetic scriptures are about over 8,000 predictive verses on almost 2,000 predictions on over seven different, 700 different matters. And that's just one cataloging by J. Barton Payne in his Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy. And uh, so it's a bunch, right? But Peter does a strange thing in one of his letters, second letter. He says, he says, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Wow, wouldn't you have liked to have been there, actually seen some of this? And then Peter goes on, though, to make a very strange remark. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. A more sure word. What Peter's saying, I was an eyewitness, but you've got something even better than being an eyewitness. The more sure word of prophecy. And we're indebted to Peter Stoner's book many years ago who dreamed up this particular approach. I've, I've tailored it to make it a little more, uh, a little different. Uh, leave it there. Lord uh, Kelvin, William Thompson, uh, uh, known as Lord Kelvin, uh, one of the great scientists of, of, of history, he says, until we can measure a thing, we really know very little about it. Well, you believe the Bible, uh, how sure are you? Can you measure your confidence? Yes, you can. The Old Testament was translated into Greek to, in 270 B.C. It's a matter of record. You can check any <coughs> competent encyclopedia. They'll confirm <coughs> under Ptolemy Philadelphus, he funded the, the 70 scholars to get the, the best scholars they could find to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek because most Jews in the world in that day spoke Greek. They, did, they used Hebrew like, you, like, a Latin, like a Catholic would use Latin ceremonially, but many Jews didn't really know Hebrew. They, want, they knew Greek because that was a, the language of the day. They wanted the scriptures a common language. That's what they did in 270 B.C. It took 15 years. That's when they finished it. Started 285 B.C., finished about 270. Okay, that's a matter of history. The point is, the Old Testament contains over 300 prophecies detailing the Messiah, the coming Messiah. That's a bunch. And what I thought we'd do tonight is go over each one of those. <laughs> All right, no, I won't do that. Let's, let's just talk about the ones that are quoted in the Gospels. There are a lot of them that go beyond, the, but there's these... He was supposed to be of David's family. He was born of a, to be a born of a virgin. He would be born in Bethlehem. He would sojourn in Egypt. He would live in Galilee, in fact, in Nazareth. He would be announced by an Elijah-like herald he, he, that would occasion the massacre of Bethlehem's children. Uh, he would proclaim a jubilee to the world. His mission would include the Gentiles. That's in Isaiah 42 and elsewhere. His ministry would be one of healing. He would teach through parables. He would be disbelieved, then rejected by the rulers. That's all laid out in the Old Testament. Did you know that? 
remarkable, isn't it? Let's just take the last week of his ministry. He would make a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He would be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. He would be like a smitten shepherd. He would be given vinegar and gall. They would cast lots for his garments. His side would be pierced. Not a bone would be broken. He would die among malefactors. His dying words were foretold. The first and last quotes are in the Old Testament. He would be buried by a rich man. He would rise from the dead on the third day. That's all through there, by the way. And the resurrection would be followed by the destruction of Jerusalem. It's all in the Old Testament. Okay? So I'm not going to take all 300. I'm going to select eight of them. And I'm going to select what probably are eight of the simplest ones to deal with for a little exercise that I think you'll find provocative. The first one is very familiar to you. And that's, we see it on the Christmas cards every, every day, Micah 5.2. That was the reference that Herod scribes brought forth when the Magi inquired, where is he that's to be born king of the Jews? Micah says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. This verse is so full of insights, we could spend a whole week on it. But we're going to just extract the one obvious step in that it tells where the birthplace of the Messiah would be. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. The question I want to pose is what's the probability of any person that's lived in the last couple of thousand years taken at random of fulfilling this? Well, that's like asking how, what's the probability of somebody at random being born in Bethlehem, right? How many of you know someone born in Bethlehem? Can I see a show of hands? Come on, people. How many of you know someone born in Bethlehem? Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, besides him. <laughs> All right. Well, the population of Bethlehem is about 7,000 people. So we'll just round it off up to make it easy arithmetic. We'll call it something less than 10,000. Uh, 10, and... Uh, at any one time throughout the world, let's assume over the last few thousand years, there's something less than a billion people over the period there. So the probability of someone being born in Bethlehem is about 10 to the 4th divided by 10 to the 9th, or 1 in 10 to the 5th, or putting it another way, one chance in 100,000. If you have an audience, you'd have to have an audience, a random audience of over 10,000 to have a probability of having somebody, hey, I was born in Bethlehem, okay? That's all we're saying. It's probably less than that. We're trying to be conservative here because... It's actually smaller than, the, you know, anyway. Let's take the next one. It's out of Zechariah 9, 9. Probably also familiar to you. The Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh to thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. This is the prediction in Zechariah that the Messiah would present himself as riding a donkey, entering Jerusalem, that event that we later celebrate on what we call the triumphal entry, right? Okay. How many have presented themselves as a king to Jerusalem riding a donkey? Even General Gordon, when he entered, he took, got off his horse and he walked in. He wouldn't presume. Well, what's the probability of someone doing that? Well, I don't know that there were any but I, if I say there's less than one in a hundred, am I being generous? Yeah. For sure, okay. For our purposes, that'll do. Let's go to the number three. This is in Zechariah 11, and it's pretty straightforward. He says, I said to them, if you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. What does 30 pieces of silver echo in your mind? The betrayal of? Jesus. Okay, good. How many people, the last few thousand years, have been betrayed for 30 pieces of silver? I don't know of any. Let's assume there were some. If I say less than one in a thousand, am I being generous? I think so. I could say one in probably 10 million. It'd be still right, but I'll say one in a thousand. Let's keep it simple. This next one is sort of related, but I'm treating it separately. Zechariah 11:13. 13, a couple of verses later, he said, The Lord said unto me, Cast it into the potter. A goodly price that I was prized out of them. 
and I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So Zechariah, for some reason, is led by the Lord, is acting out a prophecy here. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Now, you won't follow this unless you've been reading your gospel very carefully. Let's take a look at what really happened. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. I find that remark very interesting because if Satan has indwelt Peter, uh, excuse me, indwelt uh, Judas, then it's Satan declaring Christ's innocence, which I think is kind of interesting. But anyway, he says, I betrayed innocent blood. What did the chief priest say to him? What is that to us? See out of that. In the Hebrew, it's tough luck, old buddy. No, anyway, that's the idea. Okay. So he cast down the 30 pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. The story's not over yet. The chief priest took the silver pieces and said it's not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. See, it was prohibited. They could not take the price of blood, put it in the treasury. It was prohibited. But the chief priests had good accountants on staff. Okay? And uh, so they took counsel and brought with them the, bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. See, the temple had a burden. When someone died in its precincts that was, uh, had no next of kin, the temple had to deal with the burial. That was a cost. Every year there's maybe one or two, some number, and it was something they had to deal with. They couldn't put the money in the treasury because that's illegal, but they could prepay expenses with it. Okay? You could buy a year's worth of gas or something. Well, they bought a field that they had a need for when people, strangers, die that the temple had to deal with. So they took counsel, brought, brought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field is called uh, the field of blood to this day. But notice the f- key factors here. The price was 30 pieces of silver. The location of the transaction was where? In the temple, in the house of the Lord. Who ends up with the money? The potter. That's all embodied in Zechariah 11.13. What's the probability of that randomly? Probably one in 10 billion. I don't know, but I'm going to say one in 100,000 I'm being, to get the intersection of that. It's pretty remote. This is a very special one to me, and I'll explain why in a minute. Number five. One shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? And then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. When I was in my teens for a while, I got on a kick of doing Bible memory work. And whenever I found an interesting verse, I would type the verse on a little two, th- two by three cards. I'd type it on one side and put the reference on the other, and I'd carry some of these with me to try to, you know, to learn them. And uh, uh, which is another reason I'm glad I stayed with the King James. One reason I like the King James today is because I know it'll be around 20 years from now. The new ones will be eclipsed by better new ones, fine. But I'm glad when it's Bible memory is one of the things that I'm glad I didn't invest all my energy in some, I won't pick one to talk about, but one that is no longer the Vogue one. You follow me? King James is safe. It's got problems, but they're well known. So, Okay. But as I started to memorize this thing, I kept stumbling. I caught it, you know, what wounds in hands? Oh, wow, there's a prophecy. And I typed it up and added it to my little collection. And I'd start trying to memorize it. And one shall say to him, what are these wounds in hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. The more I thought about that, I could not visualize a group of Roman soldiers driving spikes through his wrists as being in the house of his friends. And I get to John 20, verse 25. The week before, well, actually the night, on, on on the, the resurrection evening, that morning he raised from the dead, he goes with the Emmaus disciples to Emmaus, and then that night they all gather, and while they're all together, Christ appears in the midst of them. T- Thomas was not with them. You can imagine what the next day was like. Hey, buddy, you should have been in this Bible study last night. Guess who showed up? And Thomas said to them, except I see in his hands the print of his nails, put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into sight, I will not believe. That's where he gets the label doubting Thomas here, right? Okay. Well, 
Eight days later, again with his disciples, they were in inside room, and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, oh, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it in my side. Be not faithless, but believing. Can you imagine Thomas being shook? First of all, here the Lord supernaturally shows up, okay? And then it's obvious that he heard what he said a week before. Ouch! Ooh! Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord, my God. I visualize him falling on his knees with that one. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Now when I go back to Zechariah 13, 6, what are these wounds on hands? Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. What wounded Christ was not the nails. It was Thomas's unbelief. Well, anyway, how many people taken at random have been wounded in their hands in the house of their friends? I'll say one in a thousand and I'm being generous. Fair enough? Number six. Isaiah, you have to take one or a couple from Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Ooh. How many prisoners accused of a capital crime, in other words, death penalty, Make no defense, even though innocent. There may have been some. There may have been some that were innocent and didn't choose to defend themselves. Don't know how many. I say less than one in a thousand. Is that fair enough? I think so. Okay, one more here. A couple more, I guess. It says, He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. How many people died among the wicked and yet were buried with the rich that were not attorneys. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to. No, all kidding aside, how many died among the wicked and yet buried with the rich? There's an implicit contradiction there. I'm going to say less than one in a thousand. I think I'm being generous. Last one, just to wrap it up. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. That's a very strange death to be described in the Psalms. Because the official form of execution in Israel was stoning, not crucifixion. This was written 700 years before crucifixion was invented. It was invented by the Persians and widely adopted subsequently by the Romans. How many people, taken at random, have died by having hands and feet pierced? Well, tens of thousands, I'm sure. But if I say one in 10,000 in the, in, the in the population of the world, I think I'm being generous. You with me so far? Okay, let's tie it together. See, where are we going here? Born in Bethlehem, king on a donkey, 30 pieces of silver, temple potter and all that business, wounds in the hands, no defense, no innocent, died with the wicked, grave with the rich, and crucified. Okay, we've got eight prophecies here. Now, the next thing we're facing here <coughs> requires a little tutoring. I'm interested in the combination. What's the chance of a particular person fulfilling all of these? We have the probability of each individual one. What's the prob composite probability of all of them? Well, how do we go about that? Let me give you a little tutoring here. If I had a population here of 100 people, say, and let's assume that 60% of you are male and 40% are female, if I have someone blindfolded, and they reach out and tap someone on the shoulder, what's the probability that they picked a female? Well, what you do, you take the total population. I've got 60% male, 40% female. Obviously, the probability of touching a female shoulder, so to speak, is 0.4, 40% or 0.4. You with me so far? Okay, let's assume I have a population of 60% right-handed people and 40% left-handed. And for these discussions, let's assume that they're uniformly distributed. What is the probability that someone selected at random is left-handed? Well, same thing, 40%, right? Okay, here's the point I'm trying to get to. What's the probability of those same circumstances of selecting a left-handed female? Well, I take the one distribution of left-handedness, and I take the other distribution of masculine or feminine, and I put those two together, 
and take the one that's in common. Follow me? So the chances of getting a left-handed female would be 0.4 times 0.4, or point, that turns out to be 0.16. In other words, what I do is I multiply those probabilities to get the composite one. Follow me so far? Okay. Now you can figure out why I use powers of 10 all the way through here, because the easy way of multiplying powers of 10 is just count the zeros. And if you count all those zeros, you'll discover there's 28 of them. So the probability of a single person involved here is the product of those eight, which turns out to be 10 with 28 zeros after. You with me so far? I'm not quite through, because what we've got to do, we want to divide that by the total population we're dealing with. I'm going to assume in the last few thousand years, if I have 100 billion, that's more than enough. And uh, uh, we probably had congressmen there not checking anyhow. Anyway, um, <laughs> So I take the 1028 and divide it by 10 to the 11th. The way you do that is simply subtract the exponent. So I've got 10 to the 17th here. Now, if I was in a statistics class and I was going to try to convey to you what I mean by one chance in 100, the typical way to get that idea across is to get a bucket, get, say, 100 silver dollars, put it in the bucket, take one of them and put some uh, a nail polish on it or something, put it in the bucket, so I've got one that's marked of the 100, and I shake it all up and create a situation where I have an equal chance of getting any one of them. I reach down there and I pull out. My chance of picking out the one I marked is one chance in 100. Are you following me? That's a way we get across this concept, what we mean by probability. It's one chance in 100. Okay, my difficulty here is I've got to get across to you what we mean by one chance in 10 to the 17th. 10 to the 17th turns out to be a very, very big number. So what I need to do is get a bucket and put 10 to the 17th silver dollars in it, right? Okay, it turns out, how do I do that? Well, I take the state of Texas and I f fill it two foot deep with silver dollars. It turns out if you go through the arithmetic, that's about 10 to the 17th silver dollars. So I mark one of them with some lipstick or whatever. And I take Gary, blindfold him, and put him on a tour in such a way that he has an equal chance of being exposed to any one of those. He reaches down there with his blindfold and picks out his chance of picking the one we mark is one chance in 10 to the 17th. You with me so far? Okay, it's pretty remote, right? Two feet deep, wow, okay. Well, I want to do this again. We took eight prophecies before. I'm not going to take you through another eight. In fact, if I picked any other eight, they're going to be more specific, that is more rare, than the ones we picked. I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to assume that the next eight have a distribution no different than the first ones. They're actually going to be much more specific, but let's not complicate it. So I got over 300 to choose from. The next eight would probably be more specific, that is less likely than the previous ones, but I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to assume no decrease in likelihoods. I now have 10 to the 28 times 10 to the 28, right? So that's 10 to the 56th. I've got to divide that by the 10th, the 11th of all the people lived. So that means I I've now have a prob problem of communicating to you one chance in 10 to the 45th. That is a really big number, okay? So I need to create a bucket with 10 to the 45th silver dollars in it. How big is that bucket? It's more than the state of Texas. In fact, I need to take an astronomical unit that's defined as the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Okay. I need to make a ball of silver dollars. But to make one with 10 to the 45th silver dollars, I need to have a ball that's 30 times the distance, the radius is 30 times the distance of the Earth to the Sun. Now we get Gary with a space suit on. We mark one of those. We mix them up so they could be anywhere. And we send them out there. And his chance of reaching out and picking one at random is one chance in 45th. You with me so far? One more time. I want to do this one more time. I'm not going to double it this time. I'll triple it. We went from 8 to 16, now we're going to go from 16 to 48, just to pick a number. And uh, so, remember, I got, 
I want 48. I got 300 of these things to pick from. And I'm going to assume no decrease in likelihoods. Actually, it'd be much more precise, but I'm ignoring that aspect, okay? So it's 10 times 28, six times. So I got 10 to the 168th, but I got to divide by the 10 to the 11th, all the people. So now I have a problem of trying to create an imaginary concept here to get across how rare is one part in 10 with 157 zeros after. Well, silver dollars won't work on this. They're too big. So I'm going to indulge in imagining what is probably the smallest thing you can imagine. It's called an atom. Okay? Now, I'm going to make a ball, a collection, of every atom in the universe. Turns out there's a widely accepted estimate that there's about 10 to the 66th atoms in our galaxy. Okay? Okay. But I'm only 10, 6, 10 to the 66th. I've got to find a way to get to 10 to the 157th. Okay. I will make such an imaginary ball for each atom in the universe. So I got 10 to the 66th times 10 to the now I got, I'm up to 10 to the 132nd. Ooh. I'm still a long way from 10 to the 157th. So I've got to do this silly imaginary thing every second since the universe began, assuming it was about 15 billion years ago. That turns out to be 10 to the 17th seconds. So I multiply 10 to the 132 by 10 to the 17th. I'm now at 10 to the 149th. I'm still not at 150, 10 to the 157th. I'm still short by 100 billion times. So that's as large a concept as you and I can get our minds around. Let me say it another way. And by the way, we only dealt with 48 of the 300. Do you see where I'm headed here? I am more certain that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel than I am of any other fact in my existence, including my own name. Because there's nothing else I can think of that I know by that certainty. All this was extracted, of course, from hour 13 of Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. And uh, if you want to get in this again. And by the way, in doing this, I haven't chosen the most amazing of the prophecies. His detailed genealogy is staggering to lay out. The specific prediction of the exact day that the Messiah would present himself as king to Jerusalem. The prophet Gabriel told Daniel 500 years earlier the exact day that Jesus would present himself as a king riding that donkey in Jerusalem. Staggering in itself. Just that one thing is such an absolute demonstration that Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be. The Old Testament Midrashic prophecies, it goes on and on and on. The 69 weeks. The commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the desire of the king, Gabriel says, um, and by the way, all of this was translated into Greek three centuries before the fact. So it's in black and white, whoever wrote it. And uh, what Gabriel says to Daniel is 100, there's 173,000 days from that commandment which was yet to happen to the Messiah. We know that decree was ex decree of Art Xerxes Lion Germanus on March 14th to 445 B.C. The only time he allowed himself to be presented as king was the triumphal entry on April 6, 32 A.D. And these can all be verified. Uh, uh, Sir Robert Anderson was knighted. He did his study and published it in 1894 and uh, uh, head of Scotland Yard, interestingly enough. But anyway, uh, uh, if you go through the arithmetic, you'll discover that Gabriel's margin for error was zero. The exact day that he predicted was the exact day that it happened. And that is staggering in its implications, and you can verify this by any s diligent study. See, the epistemological approach, epistemology is a study of knowledge, its scope and its limits, its, its, its origin, its scope, and its limits. That's what epistemology means. And our, we first of all establish the integrity of the design of the, the 66 books. Great. Once you discover that it's a design, you quickly discover they present a person in history, the Messiah. He establishes identity from before and during and subsequently. And he then, once you realize who he is, the creator, the guy that created the universe, allowed himself to become a man and enter his creation to fulfill a destiny that we could not fulfill for ourselves. And he then also along the way authenticates the whole package. That closed the loop. That's bulletproof. 
You need to understand it and be able to do it yourself. The return of Christ to rule. Almost 2,000 references in the Old Testament. 17 books give promise to the event. 318 references in the New Testament. It's emphasized everywhere. For every prophecy of Christ's first coming, there are about seven or eight of His second coming. They're going to happen with the same precision that the first ones did. I've got a challenge for you before you leave. We'll wrap it up. I'm putting on something on the screen that I hope you challenge. If you accept what I put on the screen, you flunk the course. I believe it, but that's not the point. I believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's a preposterous statement. But to challenge that, you've got to do two things. You've got to find out what the Bible says, not what Chuck Missler says or anybody else. It's too important. Find out for yourself what the Bible actually says. The second thing you've got to do is you've got to find out what's really going on. And you won't on the 10 o'clock news. Now, in today's world, you can, but it takes some diligence to find out what's really happening, not to swallow the lies and the deceit that comes out of our government and the media, and on it goes. You've got to do some homework. What's your action plan? What's God calling you to do? That's the question. Every one of us, me included, need to raise the bar on our walk continually, on our personal walk. And the best place to do that is in a small group. Sunday morning church is great, but that's not enough. You need to meet in a small group of your own choosing during the week to do a systematic study of the Bible. You don't have to be a lead, you don't have to be a teacher to be a leader. You can invite a few friends over and pop a DVD in the player and then just talk about it. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will take over. Need someone just to facilitate, make sure one person doesn't dominate, make sure everybody participates, just facilitate the thing. But whatever you do, I, 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 in the six years I've been a Christian, I've seen the pe place I've seen people grow is a small group. Small enough to ask questions without embarrassment and uh, uh, small enough to hold each other accountable to something. Uh, six to 12 is the right number. But in any case, whatever you do, commit to a systematic study to really learn your Bible. Well, I read it every day. I assume that. That's devotional reading. No, I'm talking about systematic study of the Word seriously. And that's a lifetime thing. But whatever it is, respond to His calling now. Time is short for all of us, shorter than we probably have any idea. So with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Beyond coincidence, no, it's design. The universe was designed and your Bible is designed and by the same guy. Amazing. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we stagger as we begin to apprehend what you have done for us by providing us these treasures. We do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit and through your Word, that each of us might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our coming King. We pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would illuminate precisely what it is you would have of us in the days ahead, that we might be more pleasing in thy sight as we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our coming King. Amen.